Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I'm so excited and so honored to talk to today's guest because you guys kept saying, when's he going to be on the show? Well, today's the day. His books have sold more than 3 million copies. He's had nine bestsellers published in 31 languages. Interesting that it's 31 because that seems to be a, a very important number to his uh, life experience. Please welcome John Robbins. I, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me because you're one of my favorite people. Well, thank you, Chef AJ. I'm, I'm glad to be with you and your audience. Yeah, this is so exciting. You know, people that I talk to or people I have on my show, a lot of times they're plant-based doctors or chefs. And I always ask them what their story is of vegan or plant-based, when and why they decided to go. And people that have gone plant-based, say, in the last 10 years, usually point to maybe the documentary Forks Over Knives or read the China study. But people that have been doing it a long time, like me, 45 years, you ask them and they always say it was your book, Diet for a New America. Did you have any idea when you wrote it back then that it would help so many people? No, I had no idea whatsoever. And I just felt drawn to, to write it. And, and I never thought about once about would it be published, who would read it, how many people would read it, would it make money, you know, how many books would sell. That was never a, a thought in my mind. I just didn't think that way. What I thought about was, how do I construct this argument? How do I make this case with as much clarity and as much compassion as possible for everybody involved? Which includes the meat producers, includes those of us who are eating meat and have grown up eating meat, those of us who've never thought about it, those of us who have thought about it a lot and care about it a lot. How, how do I... Um, because I, I wanted then, I still want now to, to build a bigger movement, a more inclusive movement, a movement that welcomes people wherever they're at and doesn't insist, oh, you have to sign a purity pact. You have to be a, an exclusive vegan. You have to be pure about it in, in order for me to love you, for in order to be included in this movement, in order to be a force for good in this world. And, and I, I really do think one of the flaws in the vegan movement has been the emphasis on purity, the, the sense that you have to be <clears throat> really, really pure in order, order, I don't know, in order to what? In order to something. <laughs> to go to heaven? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, go to heaven, I don't know. And, and I really want us to um, build build a world of compassion that includes everybody. And and. So I, I, I remember people who responded to Diet for New America. I remember one letter I got that's where somebody said, the book that really moved them, uh, they were eating less bacon now. And part of me, when I heard that was just like disappointed. That's all you can do? Less bacon? You're still eating some bacon? You, I mean, it's like, really? You read their book and, and that's your, I mean, it felt so, and yet I, I knew, who knows what the social realities of that person's life are, what they're dealing with, you know, and who knows? And if I can appreciate and welcome and congratulate them even for that small step, maybe then it will lead to another step and another step. And another. some of us jump, we go full tilt, we, we, you know, others of us make small steps and incrementally make our way. There's room for everybody, all these different personality styles or, or uh, energetic dynamics there are welcome the point is we want to save the animals from this e egregious cruelty we want to save the planet from the defilement and the pollution and, and the predatory way that we've had of of relating to it we want to save our, our our hearts and our lives and our health and frankly our souls because i think when we participate in that in, in something that's as cruel and as damaging as industrial meat production has become, even if we don't know about it, it, it takes a toll on us. Um, obviously it, it, it harms our health, but so a lot of us wanna be part of the solution. A lot of us wanna, there's this old saying, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. We're looking for ways for it to begin with me. How, how do we create more peace in our lives and our hearts and our, our experience of ourselves and also in our relationships with the world and also in the world itself, more peace, more harmony, more beauty, more love, more, more joy, more, more hope, more, all these qualities of energy and of experience that 
make us fully, feel fully human, M make us glad to be alive, M make us grateful for the gift of our, of our existence. And, and allow us to be forces of nature's beauty rather than, I mean, you can find everything in nature if, if you look for it, but, but we don't have to be predators. We, we don't have to prey on life to, to uh, live fruitful and healthy lives. And in fact, the, the data is pretty conclusive that when we eat a healthy whole foods, plant-based diet, we're, we're, we're doing the optimal thing for our health as well. It sounds to me like the movement you're really leading is a movement of compassion. Well, that, that's certainly how it lives in me. Um, and it, it's been painful for me to see sometimes in the vegan movement how uncompassionate we as vegans can be towards people who, who, who aren't. You know, we can be judgmental. There's this phrase, holier than thou, you know, we can be more vegan than thou. Veganer than thou. You know, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer says the reason so many vegans get headaches is from wearing their halos too tight. <laughs> right. So we, we, you know, we do. And, and I think we should just take our halos off because we're, we're not angels. We're human beings. And all of us are. We're flawed. We're, we're, we're growing. We're, we're a mess. And uh, maybe, maybe we could be a beautiful mess. You know, I mean, it's that's I don't think we have a chance to not be a mess, but I think we could be a more beautiful, more kind mess, a more caring mess, and and maybe make less of a mess of things in the process if we have more caring as as part of our what we bring to life, what we share with the world, what what we how we, how we make a statement out of our lives of, of, of compassion. Yeah, I think that's really one of my questions later was what do you want to be remembered for? And I think that's really what people associate you with. Is that exactly what you're saying? Well, I, I don't care what I'm remembered for. I, I don't care if I'm remembered at all. But what I do care about is that the, there be more compassion in the world, that there be more compassion in people's lives and hearts because we all need it. We all need to be loved. Yeah. We all need to love. And a lot of us didn't grow up in families where love prevailed. We didn't learn emotional intelligence. We didn't learn how to uh, bring our lives into alignment with our, our higher selves and our inner wisdom. We, we, we didn't learn that at all. We learned to cope, we learned to manage, we learned to deal with trauma and stress as best we could. We, we, we learned coping mechanisms and frankly, defense mechanisms and reactive mechanisms and, and we getting identified with those. The journey from that damage, from that trauma, to wholeness, that the journey to to compassion, to to, to, a, to living in accord with the truth of your heart, that takes a lot. That that's that's a hell of a journey. That that takes a lot uh, out of a human being, and and not all of us are capable of it. Uh, but I think all of us have a, a yearning to an extent, to varying degrees for that type of a, of a path. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to walk my path with as much compassion as I can and learn from those times when I'm not compassionate. Yeah. Um, so hopefully to become more so yeah. eventually in some way. Diet for a New America came out, I believe it was 35 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, 1987. That was before the internet, is before anybody of, ever uttered the words global warming. How did you know what you knew then? And how did you get a publisher for that book way back then? Well, it's true that, that global warming what wasn't spoken of much yet, but there was a book called The End of Nature that a friend of mine named Bill McKibben wrote and, and published in 1990. And it, it was the first major book that talked about climate change or global warming, or it's gone by different, different phrases, obviously at different times, but I, I was aware of it then. And I was aware of the extent to which the, the methane that ruminant animals produce um, through erectation, it's, it's, it's actually the kind of belch, most, most of it comes out the front end, not the back end, though some does there too. And, and the level of, um, of, of uh, energy use in meat production is egregious. So I knew that we are not only creating a diet that's killing us, and we're, but it's killing the world too. 
And I, and I thought if we, if we could really grasp the environmental implications of our food choices and start to be, behave more as citizens of planet Earth than as selfish uh, people. You know, honoring our, our, our mutual interdependence with all of life, honoring our place in the whole web of life so that we relate to other beings with as much reverence and respect as we can versus just seeing them as objects to use for our own use, whatever that might be. I mean, I think that's true about everything. Like if you go into a forest, you can be soothed and comforted and even inspired by the beauty. You, you can be nourished by the, the, the deep fresh air that you, that you can breathe there. And, or you can go in there and say, well, how many board feet can I get out of this forest? And, and that's the commercial mindset. That's the, I call it the predatory mindset. And it's, a, it's, it's an impoverishing uh, uh, mindset because maybe it's designed to make money, you know, convert the forest to board feet, you sell the board feet of timber and you make money. So th th that, that, that mental state is, uh, is thinking about making money, prospering, being successful in that way. But in truth, it's impoverishing because it disconnects us from the beauty and the mystery and the magic and the joy and sometimes the misery of life. I think when we take our place, our rightful place in the web of life with respect for all other life forms, their right to live, um, there, there are different kinds of, of beauty and, uh, and if it, different ways of expressing this, the soul force of, of creation that then getting into a right relationship, a reverent relationship, a respectful relationship with, with all beings. It, to me, I, I can th hardly think of anything more important. And, and when we do that, when we, or at least work to do that, we, we undermine that part of ourselves, that identity that we've culturally taken on as exploiters, as predators, as self-absorbed people. There's so much in our society that, well, even the way we define success, if, if, if you say, Chef AJ, if you said somebody's a success, most likely what you would mean by that phrase is that they've made a lot of money or that they have a lot of money. That we, we, that's how we as a culture define success. We, we do it in monetary terms, financial terms. I, th I think that's a very um, poor way to define success because a human being, this, a successful human being, I mean, each of us might define that differently but it would probably, for me anyway, it would include something like ca the capacity to bring love into situations where it's needed, um, to, to care for people in need, people who are hurting, um, uh, to, to um, create harmony where there's been friction, to, to bring peace where there's been conflict, to, br to bring understanding where there's been misunderstanding. I mean, it, it is all basic stuff, but but... I think it's, it's, it's when we define success the way our culture does and define what a man is and what a woman is the way our culture does, it, it, it reduces all of us. It diminishes all of us. And so my effort has been to expand all of us, to enlarge all of us, to, to, to inspire a, an awakening to who we could be uh, on this earth as embodied people um, if we let our compassion reign. If we really let compassion be the art, the, the, the criteria of our, of our decisions and our choices. Well, you made some choices that like to walk away from a, fa a fortune at a very young age that a lot of people would have probably struggled making that choice. That was a pivotal choice in your life. Yeah, and I struggled with it. Um, I didn't struggle around, should I make that choice? I knew I, I, knew I needed to, um, but I struggled with how to do it because I did not want to hurt my father. And he, I'm, I'm an only son, I'm, I'm his only son. And, and so I had sisters, but no brothers. And in his world, um, he was an old fashioned patriarch. And in his way of thinking, he didn't want his daughters to work. He wanted them to be taken care of by their husbands, which pretty much meant being owned by them, I guess. But that's an old way of thinking. I don't, I'm, I'm glad that it's for the most part 
a thing of the past, but it, it prevailed in his, in his mind and his life. So he didn't offer my sisters a job. He didn't want them to work. I, so the whole weight of his expectations was on me. And he groomed me from my earliest child to succeed him. And, and I, I, you know, we, it wasn't like he was manufacturing plutonium triggers for nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, he, was, he was making ice cream and, and, and the, the, most people like it, you know, um, and find pleasure in, in, in it. And, I invented flavors. I mean, I, I was part of the company for a you while. Gotta, I, 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 this story's so important, but tell me what flavors you invented. Well, the most famous one is Jamocha Almond Fudge. That was a good one. I, it's See, been... there was, J Jamocha was a, a, a word that blended the word Java and mocha. It's coffee ice cream. Um, Baskin Robbins developed its own coffee blend, you know, uh, called it, they invented the word Jamocha. And, um, then I had the idea, well, what if we put almonds, you know, roasted almonds in a, in a chocolate kind of uh, ribbon or ripple in it. And um, that was my thought. And we worked on the, f the flavor development together. And I was pretty young then, but, but, but we, it became one of our best sellers. And, you know, it, it was kind of cemented. It, it was so successful that my dad really thought, oh, this kid's got potential, you know? <laughs> um, which made it harder, honestly, because he then, he was really invested in me working with him and, and um, you know, following in his footsteps and eventually owning the company. And I, I didn't, um, I didn't want to hurt him, but that wasn't who I was. And I knew that was, if I, if I did that to please him, and we all want to please our parents, but if, it, if, if we do something to please them that's contrary to the very nature of why we've taken birth, to our, our, our purpose for being alive. No good's gonna come from that. Um, and, and I knew that and I knew I had to find a way to tell him, but I, that would hurt him the least, I guess, was my, because I, 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 uh, I didn't know how to do it uh, that wouldn't hurt him at all. Now, did you ever think, well, I'll take over the company, but I'm gonna make 31 vegan flavors? No, uh, because it, it wasn't, it, my dad was still in, at, his, at his, the heights of his power. And he was running the company the way he had built it to run. My uncle, Bert Baskin, had died already and, or was dying at that moment. And, and um, it was clear he was on it, he was going. And um, so it was my dad's company. And he wasn't vegan in any sense, at that time, in any sense of the word. So he wouldn't have been open to a, a, a partnership in which we moved in that direction. He would not have been. He, he mocked my concerns for animals. He, he um, did not think uh, that there was any connection between food and health. So ice cream or heart disease, he would never have. And even the environment, he, he said, well, you, you tree huggers, you, you know, you're not realistic, you know, and it's like he was not the kind of person that you could have, I could have done that type of a thing with. Um, there wasn't an, enough shared uh, values to do it. Um, and besides, even vegan ice creams aren't healthy. Yeah. I mean, for a treat once in a while, sure. But if you're in the ice cream business, you want people to eat as much as possible or buy as much as possible. That's the model. And I grew up with that. And I, I, I needed to find a different uh, approach to my life than that. It must have been hard, though, very hard to do that. It was. It, it really was. And, and for a long time, my dad didn't, and I didn't, we stopped speaking. He didn't want anything to do with me. And I guess the feeling was somewhat mutual. I mean, I, at a certain point, it was just... I mean, if all you're going to do is fight, what's the point? Yeah. So um, I took some space and he took some space and we just, uh, but, but then as, as you, you know this story and I'll just tell it briefly because it is kind of amazing what happened. Here's the, my dad is a tycoon. He, he's an extremely successful businessman. He owns and runs a, what, what, be, what by then was the world's largest ice cream company. And, um, 
he was used to getting his way. <laughs> um, but we went our separate ways. The die was cast. I'd made my choice. I, and I didn't have any act. I chose him. I, did, I told him I didn't want to have any inheritance. I didn't want to have a trust fund. I didn't want to have any access whatsoever, any dependence whatsoever on his money, which is how I've lived my life. And since then, uh, for the, the last, what now, for 44 years. Um, no, 54 years. 54 years. <laughs> God, it's true. But so he, we went our separate ways. He continued to eat lots of ice cream and his steaks and everything. And he developed heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and a bunch of other Ill illnesses. He was really sick. And one day, shortly after, when, when Diet for New America was first published, I sent him a copy, an autographed copy, but I'm sure he didn't read it. He didn't want anything to do with the son that had rejected his life work. And that was kind of bitter, um, but he, he, his health was failing. He went to his cardiologist and um, the guy said to him, Mr. Robbins, at this point, you're pretty sick. Um, all we can do at this point is juggle your medications, try to control some of the side effects that are bothering you and try to make your few remaining years a little more comfortable. Because my father's diabetes had progressed to the point where they were talking about an amputation of a foot, even a leg maybe, a possible blindness. Um, his blood pressure was completely out of control, even with the meds. He took a lot of these meds and that side effects were bothering him a lot. Um, He'd had one heart attack already. He was a candidate for another. My uncle, Bird Baskin, had died of a series of heart attacks in his early 50s. He ate a lot of ice cream. My dad ate a lot of ice cream. They're both, my dad was overweight. I mean, it, quite overweight. It is, and the doctor leveled with him and said, uh, that's all we can do for you. Um, however, if you wanted to make, and were willing to make really significant changes in your lifestyle and what you ate, there might, might be a different prognosis for you. And my dad said, well, what, what do I have to do? What are you talking about? Because he was scared to hear this from the man he considered the high priest of Western medicine, the highest priced cardiologist in Rancho Mirage, California. And the guy said, well, there is a book. If you're serious, there's a book you should read. And he handed them a copy of my book, Diet for New America, which had just been published maybe a few months previous. And my father already had a copy because I'd sent him one, but he hadn't read it. And he didn't tell the doctor that he already had a copy. He did, and the doctor didn't know that the John Robbins who'd written the book was the son of his patient, Irv Robbins. He, he, he knew who my father was. He knew Baskin Robbins, but he didn't know that about that connection. And, and my dad didn't tell him, he just took the book. He didn't say, well, that's my son that wrote that. He just said, oh, okay. But it, he, now that the, it had been blessed by the, by the doctor, he started to read it and he made small changes, but he got some results and then he made more changes and he got more results. And then pretty soon his need for blood pressure medication was reducing and they were lowering his, his dose, whereas they had been raising it constantly all the time. Um, Soon enough, he didn't need insulin in anymore. Soon enough, he didn't even need um, um, diabetic pills anymore. His blood sugar levels were stabilizing. They'd been way out of control before. He lost um, all the weight he needed to lose. Um, his, all of his blood numbers, you know, his, his, uh, from cholesterol to everything were just improving dramatically. And he didn't tell me any of this was happening, but it was. And then one day he called me after a few years of this and he said, Johnny, you won't believe what I got to tell you. And I'm like, who died? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and he's like, no, you just really won't believe it. It's incredible. And I said, okay, dad, I get that it's incredible. And I'm going to have a hard time believing. What is it? What do you want to tell me? What, what's going on? He said, I, it's just incredible. You're just not going to believe it. <laughs> I said, all right. He said, well, it turns out, and who would have thought this? It turns out you were right. 
And I, I said to him, well, everyone likes to be told they're right. I certainly do, but about what? What are you talking about? And he said, well, and he told me about this meeting he'd had with the cardiologist and how he'd read my book, you know, and um, made these changes and gotten these results. And he said, now, he said, he said, I'm not a card carrying vegan. Uh, and, and if I'm at a fundraiser and they serve a steak, I'm gonna eat it, I'm not gonna make a fuss, but I don't have it in the home anymore. And, and I'm um, really proud of you. And, and I see that you followed your own star. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. You, you, I put every obstacle I could in your way and you overcame them or ignored them and insisted you know, stubbornly on being yourself and who would have thought, but it turns out that you were right and it's good that you did that. And I'm proud of you and you followed your own star and I get to be the beneficiary of it because my health is so much better now. And that began a new chapter in our lives, in our, in our relationship. And I realized eventually it came full circle. I, I, I gave him something more important than had I just done the obvious thing and, and, and done what he wanted you know, and invented a 30 second flavor. I mean, it, in, instead I was able to, maybe maybe blood is thicker than ice cream after all. You know? Oh, I love that. That is such a beautiful, beautiful story. And, it, it, and that must've made you feel so good. It did, it, it really did. And, and um, he still, there were things we couldn't talk about. His politics and mine, we were not on the same page. My, my dad had plenty of old fashioned beliefs that I'm, I don't think, uh, I want to take on, but, but he, uh, you know, we started to have love between us. We started to have a loving connection and, and there hadn't been that before. And, and uh, at least not for a very long time. And, and in the, you know, I was there when he died on his deathbed. And it was actually a very beautiful moment for me. And of course very sad as well, but even the fact that it was sad was beautiful because for me, the, the estrangement had been so great. The alienation had been so great that that I don't know that I would have been sad when he died. Maybe even more relieved than anything else. But because we had been able to create um, a connection and he, he was able to forgive me for not, for disappointing him so much and um, and appreciate. And, and, and I appreciated that he was able to do that. You know, a man of his identity and beliefs and wealth he, he is pretty stubborn cookie you know he's in his he's set in his ways and and that he would make a change like that and and appreciate that of what, that my life had, had, had meaning even though it wasn't what he'd planned and wanted for me um i mean that, that meant more to me than I, I i'm more proud of him for that he could do that than I am even for all his business achievements, prodigious as those are, because it was of the heart. It was, it, 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 this was a statement of compassion. This is what we were talking about earlier of, of, of bringing your life into, uh, into alignment with compassion. And he, he did that. Uh, and he was, as dumbfounded as he was that, that I had written a good book, I, I think I was even more dumbfounded that he could, could respond that way. Uh, uh, from from a, a caring place and so in the end I, you know it, it ended up to be something that and he's, he's been gone for some time now but when I think about him mostly I, re, I remember the, the the light in his eyes I, I remember the the caring that that could be expressed sometimes and I almost, I feel, this, I almost feel this could be a movie well it, it is <laughs> There are there are people making a movie of my my actually of my, not just my life but my relationship to my dad. That's amazing. Um, Where was your mother in all this? Because usually mothers really don't want a rift in the family. I know. Um, my mother was mentally ill, uh, seriously so, and um, there's not much we can say about about that really. Mm. But your relationship with your son is very different than the relationship. Oh, it's, with yeah, it really father. is. It's, it's really and ironically. My son chose, I didn't ask, I never expected, I would never have expected, but he at a certain point said he wanted to work with me. And we are partners in the Food Revolution Network, and um, which is 
thriving. We have over 800,000 members and um, we've done 11 summits that have averaged over 300,000 participants each. Some of them have been well over that. And we, we give away as much as possible. We, we make as much free. So each summit there, there's been over 2 million hours of free listening, people listening to the interviews and the other things that we pr uh, provide. Um, and that's, that thrills me that we can give as much away as possible. And then if a certain percentage of the people who are participating, it doesn't have to be a large percent, buy some of the things that we have to offer, then that provides enough revenue to keep the whole thing going. And that enables us to do something where we're giving so much away. And Chef, as you, you, you wouldn't know this about me, but when I was a kid and working at Baskin Robbins in the, in the stores, people would come in and, and I would notice the 31 flavors. That's a lot of flavors. And often there was even more than that in the store at the time. And people would want to, what's good? You know, what, 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 we, they want to try something new, but which one? And, and I wanted to, to, to get, have a way of giving them a little sample taste so they could decide. So I said to my dad, I think what we should do is have little spoons where we can give people sample tastes. And then the, I, and my dad was, oh, you can't give away free ice cream like that. And I said, well, let me try it in a store or two. I, I think it will work. I, th I think people will, will actually, they'll, they'll know what they're getting and they'll know what they, they won't, they'll, 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 oh, I like that. So they'll get more of it. They'll, they'll feel, feel more confident that they'll be buying something they'll like. And so we tried it and it was actually very effective. And eventually let, we tried it originally with these little wooden spoons and we found that there was a better mouthfeel to plastic. So we did these little plastic spoons and they were pink. And our, the Baskin Robbins colors were pink and um, brown dots, strawberry and chocolate against a white background, vanilla. Um, that was the idea. And so we have these little pink spoons. Now today, the phrase pink spoon has become a concept in, in business where, wherein you, you provide a, a sample or something for free to give people an experience of what it is that, that you're offering. Um, it's gone way beyond ice cream, but it started at Basket Robinson and it started with me. And I actually, so I'm the originator of the pink spoon. And, and, I, and, and for me, the, that, the, 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 the idea of giving and trusting then that out of the, in the re reciprocity of life in the reciprocity of the universe, when you give, you, you become open to receiving. And that's the way I wanna live. And it, it, generously, abundantly, exuberantly, um, and trust that in the reciprocity of things, we'll all be taken care of. If, if, if we can marshal that, that type of the force of compassion, um, you know, Gandhi called it satyagraha, the, the force of truth, the, 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 the force of, of the heart when it's um, fully alive and connected. It seemed like even as a youth, you had an entrepreneurial streak and those pink spoons actually is the model for a summit. You're giving yes. people a taste. If yeah. they it, they want more and they can buy it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and if not, fine. And, and we want to, because not everybody can afford things, particularly these days. And I, uh, you know, I grew up obviously very wealthy, but I, but I walked away from that and I lived quite a few years in an opposite type of uh, socioeconomic stratum. And I'm glad for that, because I, I, not that I want to particularly want to go through it again, but I, I learned a lot I, and I feel... Uh, connected to people. Most wealthy people use their wealth to isolate themselves. And then, and they're successful, they isolate themselves. Then they, they have no connection to or compassion for the pain and struggles of other people. And then they don't use their money in a ways that could help others because they're not connected to it. And so that isolation ends up perpetuating a, a schism in our society where the, the where the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots keeps growing greater and, and wealth is accumulating more and more in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And I, and I think that's a, a tragedy uh, and actually a crime. And it's something we, we really need to address. 
so I was a Bernie Sanders guy, but, you know, <laughs> um, but I, but we really do need to um, take care of each other. And this every man for himself, dog eat dog thinking. I mean, dogs don't even eat dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and a friend of mine, I gotta tell you, she said to me once that when she was a little girl and she first heard the phrase dog eat dog world, she had no concept for it. She thought they said, it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> and she loved her little doggies. So she thought that was wonderful. It so wonderful. it's a doggy dog world. So I, that's what, it is a doggy dog world. It's not a dog eat dog world. Dogs don't eat dogs. <laughs> the people who eat what we call hot dogs get cancer. I mean, it's like, we don't have to, we don't have to do that. We so have so much faith and resiliency. Yeah. Because you, you know, I mean, I'm, people, I mean, this is public knowledge. You've lost a lot of money with a not very nice person, but you bounce, you bounce back. Yeah. Well, we, we did. Yeah. Um, my son uh, and his wife had twins born in, in 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 2001. And um, they were born exceedingly premature. Um, and they're autistic and have a lot of special needs. And I love them dearly. We all love them dearly. Um, and they're, they're um, you know, seriously handicapped. And um, right around after they were born, it was really obvious that these kids are gonna take a tremendous amount of uh, work to, to raise and money. And a friend of mine who was wealthy and was uh, on the board of EarthSave and was, uh, did a lot, he was an attorney, did a lot of pro bono work for us. Um, told me he had an investment that where he had his money and he, he was very wealthy and, and, he, and he said um, he would, if he suggested that we mortgage our house to the max and put that money in, into, into in, merged with his into the investment vehicle that he had as a way to make some money for the care of the kids. and. Um, I did that and it turns out his investment was with Madoff, Bernie Madoff. I had never heard of Bernie Madoff um, on, on, and until the day that I found out all of our money was gone. <laughs> How did you react I, though? I mean, were you angry? Cause you, you, I mean, that has to be devastating. It was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. And I still had these grandkids to take care of. Only now I had no ability to do that financially. And it was devastating. I wasn't angry. I didn't have any. Um, I didn't have any space to be angry. That would have been a waste of energy. I had to use all my energy to get us out of this hole. We were suddenly in a very deep hole. We'd been flying around. It's like being on a freeway and suddenly in a full-on crash, and everything changes. So I, I didn't. Maybe, maybe I would have been angry if I had the time or space for it, but I, I didn't, I didn't. I just like, how do we cope with this? And so we, some very, some people were very generous to us and helped and I will never forget that. You know, there's this saying, a friend in, in need is a friend indeed. Well, we had some friends show up as true friends for us and um, in that sense. And, and then out of that ocean had the idea, uh, well, let's start, Food Revolution Network, let's put on these summits. It was his idea. And, and then we've been able to, to dig ourselves out of that hole. That is uh, fantastic. So he's got an entrepreneurial streak too. And oh, he really the, does. He really does. I think he's, it skipped a generation, but he's got it. He's, he's, <laughs> uh, but he's got the right values. You know, for my dad, it was, it was about money. Yeah. He, he, he was about money. And um, with Ocean, it's 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 really about service. Yeah. It's about it's not so much about making the biggest buck. It's it's about doing the most good. It's it's about making the biggest difference yeah. in people's lives, and that that's a very different place to come from as a business. What was Ocean's relationship like with your father? Not much. Um, he didn't like being around him very much. Um, Ocean didn't. 
my father was constantly trying, when Ocean was little, um, before I wrote Diver in America and my father read it and went through his changes, um, my father didn't approve of what, the way we ate. He didn't approve of the way we lived. Um, he didn't approve of anything. And he kept wanting to pull Ocean into his way of thinking. And Ocean didn't want to go there um, at all. And so they didn't, they, they were kind of cross purposes. And, you know, my father would say to him things like, well, just because you're, you know, your dad was a rebel, you could be a rebel too. You could rebel against your dad, you know, and, and we'll always have employment for you here, you know, and, um, and Ocean wasn't interested at all. <laughs> but, so they didn't see eye to eye. Um, you know, it, Ocean is a very loving man and, and he was a very loving boy and he, that's just who he is. And so he tried to find ways to, to bring out the best in my dad, but they, that, that wasn't so easy. <laughs> and uh, they, weren't, they weren't close at all. You know, I remember interviewing Ocean a long time ago and like even in his teens, he had won like all these awards and you're the recipient of the Rachel Carson Award, the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award, the Peace Abbey's Courage of Conscience Award, Green America's Lifetime Achievement Award, maybe the Nobel Peace Prize someday. Yeah, I'm, I've been given a few awards. He's, he's, he's been given more, I think. Um, but you know, I always think of awards as we're honoring something inside all of us that a particular person because of their actions or some of their actions that have become well known stands for that, represents that. But it's really a part of all of us. So, you know, the, the origins of the Nobel Prize is this guy whose last name was Noble, was a, the equivalent of today a billionaire, but he'd made his money in, in uh, manufacturing weapons and, and gunpowder and weapon uh, war, war equipment. And um, he somehow, it, 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 people thought he died, he hadn't, and, and they wrote it as, at his, his obituary in the newspaper and it said, you know, that he developed all these weapons and led to the wars becoming far more violent and da damaging. And he, but he hadn't died and he read this uh, obituary <laughs> of, of himself and he was horrified that that was his legacy. That was his, his, his uh, that's what he was known for. And he wanted to change it. So he, he used some of his money, put his money aside to, to this, created the Nobel Committee and the Nobel Prize. To, and there's, there's many Nobel Prizes. The one that we think of as the Nobel, most preeminently is the Nobel Peace Prize. And that was the one that gets where there was the most money attached and the most prestige and the most meaning for him because as somebody who had create, contributed to, to war becoming more weaponized in a, in a dangerous way, he, he wanted to offset that. And I think you know, in that story, it's like there, there, we all have these two, these conflicting parts inside us. There's a part of us that wants personal power, wants self-aggrandizement, wants to be known and seen as special and that, you know, or we all have egos. I have, mine's as big as anybody's. Um, but we, we um, but there's another part of us too. And I think that's what we're honoring with these awards, which is the part that cares and cares enough that it really matters to us how well others are doing. It's not just a nice thing, it's a crucial thing that others be well, that others, you know, I, I would love to see hunger history. I'd love to see us feed everybody. Uh, my, my, my little prayer mantra is may all be fed may all be healed and may all be loved. And I live for that. I want that. I crave that. I'm obsessed with that. I just uh, don't really see anything else as meaningful or worth doing other than what will lead to that type of an outcome or might lead to that in that direction. And I, I, I um, so with these awards, I mean, I, I don't, it, it, it's, 
the, the, the point of the award is to, to recognize and, and um, respect that part of ourselves that is capable of suffering on behalf of a greater purpose, that, that is capable of, of sacrifice on behalf of a greater purpose, that is capable of living in tune with a greater purpose. And I think we all, we, that, that, that force exists in all of us. It may be dormant, it may be traumatized, it may be shriveled, <laughs> it, it may be suppressed, silenced, but it's there and, 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 and I, I'm hoping to reflect it and, and live it in such a way that it, it grows in, in all of us. So I can see it reflected back to me and help me in my times of struggle to, uh, to, to get centered again too. You know, Dr. McDougall, who's been on the show a few times, always says the greatest joy he gets in life is helping other people. So you and Ocean must go to bed every night feeling proud or just that you're doing, you're really doing your part. <laughs> well, sometimes we go to bed tired, but <laughs> it's a lot of work. But, but yeah, there's a great deal of satisfaction in, in, in being able to, it's a privilege, really. I, I feel it's a privilege to be able to do work. You're doing it too, to be able to do work that helps people to live healthier lives and more compassionate lives. Really, isn't that a wonderful blessing to be able to do that work? Um, I, I, um, I'm thrilled, you know, that I, I've been able to do that kind of work for now, you know, more than, more than 40 years. And, and I, I'm also, just to be honest fully, I, I'm also very sad that the world is the way it is. I mean, we, we have a long ways to go. And, and although, yeah, plant-based is bigger than it ever was, there are more, you know, you go into the milk section of a grocery store and there's more non-dairy milks and there are dairy milks now. It used to be there were only dairy milks, cow's milk products. And same thing with the cheese section or, you know, it's just so, you know, and there's, there's all these, uh, there's more plant-based eating now than ever. Um, I just wish there was a lot more. I'm, I'm because this, the the, uh, the situation in the world with with climate change, with the polarization in our society, has become so dire. We need to do some pretty dramatic things um, to to rescue ourselves. Um, and the more of us who go strongly in a vegan direction. Uh, the, the more chance we'll have to actually um, have a, a continuation of our species on this planet. And, and, and not, you know, Jefferson once said, I, 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 um, I grieve for my species when I reflect that God is just. And that was his way of thinking about it. I, I know what he meant. It, it, it's that we, we've, as a species, we've, we've done, we've been very destructive and continue to be in many ways. We don't have to be though. I, I think we do have options and choices and I do think we could live a more vegan life, a more compassionate life and, and everyone could take steps in that direction. So I don't, when I, when, when people say, what do you think, can, can we get there? Can we get a place where like half of the people in the United States are vegan in, in the next five years or 10 years. And although I'd love it, honestly, realistically, I don't think that's possible. But what, here's what I do think is possible, Chef AJ. I do see it's possible that in five years or 10 years, half the meals eaten in the United States could be vegan. I, I, I think that's a quite, that's doable. So if we get off the purity pack thing where it's you're vegan or not, and start to just, we're all in this together and we're all moving in a direction, we all of making our lives more compassionate and healthy, and in environmentally attuned, well, then maybe we can grow and include everybody in the movement. And that's my hope and prayer. And that's my commitment uh, is to move in that direction. And, and um, as much as we can, as fast as we can, you know, yeah. and we'll see what happens. That's what I love about the Food Revolution Summit. You're very inclusive. And I always hear Ocean in between your interviews talking about how everybody is welcome. And I do want to say that since you're 
summit is audio only it two two compliments you have a wonderful sounding voice but you really prepare for the interviews it's like you really know the person you're interviewing and ask just great questions well thank you for that i i, I do prepare and you know it's an honor to interview the people i get to interview i i uh, every one of them I, are people who i admire and um love many of them are close friends of mine um, um virtually all of them are associates or allies um, and to, we have a, a big microphone, we have a big audience and to be able to bring their voices to that, it's, it's an honor and I wanna bring out the best in them. You know, I wanna ask the questions. I, I wanna throw the, to use a baseball metaphor that you may not relate to, but it, I, I wanna throw a fastball right into their strike zone. So they'll hit it out of the park. Yeah. But the, you know, I wanna throw it fast into their strike zone because then, then you hit a, fa a fastball hard, it goes farther. Uh, and um, I want to see them hit the biggest home runs possible. And because that's, we get the, the most benefit for the listener, for the audience, for the folks at home to incorporate this, see how this is practically available and useful in their lives. Yeah. What steps they can take. To, well, I, to, yeah. You know, and, and one of the big pieces for me, my mother, um, I mentioned to you that she was mentally ill. And, and she was seriously so. Um, she also developed uh, Alzheimer's very early. Um, and that wasn't a pretty thing to go through. And, and I'm sure uh, our listeners know what that is like to have a loved one um, take that journey. Um, it's, it's an incredibly um, sad thing. And it's not it's not necessary. We, we know it from the work of the Schur's eyes and others in, 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 uh, at, at the leading edge of, of neurology today. We, we really know that we can prevent um, more than 80% 80, 80 of all cases of Alzheimer's from ever occurring. And if, if there are a few people who have the, the worst possible genetic hand, they have two APOE4 genes. There are not too many people like that, but they, there are some. Um, and those people with the double whammy genetic um, predisposition to it tend to get it early, tend to get it in their 50s. But with, with the lifestyle changes and the food changes that will prevent it in 80% of the cases, in those few cases where it can't prevent it, it postpones it by 20 years. That matters. Mm -hmm. That really matters to get it in your 80s instead of your 60s if you have the worst possible genetic you know, um, deal. That, those 20 years matter. They're, they're meaningful, beautiful years if you make them so. And you can if you don't, if you, if you live well. And 80%, and, and we don't, we can eliminate it completely. Th this is powerful stuff. And we know this now with a certainty equivalent to the, the knowledge we have about heart disease. You know, the work of Dean Arnish, the work of, 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 of uh, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn and others, have, we, we, we have proof as you know, that we can prevent almost all cases of heart disease and we can re reverse almost all cases, even advanced heart disease, even people who are on the, the, uh, the waiting list to get a heart transplant. That's how seriously ill they are. If they change their diet um, and do a few other basic things, they often recover. They don't need the transplant. They don't need the drugs. They don't need stands. They don't need other things. They just get well. And it's amazing that you can heal the heart like that. You can heal the brain like that. You can heal the liver, the kidneys, the lungs. You know, you can heal every organ in the body. Your skin will be better. Your, 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 your smile will be brighter. Your eyes will be brighter. Your hair will be a little more lustrous. Your, I mean, this, you went across the board and you do it by eating in a more compassionate way that causes less suffering to others. Isn't that a wonderful thing, Chef AJ, that the food choices that are healthiest for us individually, that selfishly give us the longest and healthiest lives, just in terms of our own personal well-being, are also better for others, also cause the least amount of water pollution and air pollution and soil erosion and a pollution of all kinds that cause the least amount of animal suffering. They, they, they allow for, for the most, uh, food to be available for the most other other people to be fed. 
they take the, the, the least toll on the ecosystem. It's, it's a win, 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 win. And to me, it's telling us something about the nature of life and the nature of human existence. It, it addresses some of these really profound existential questions that we all have and live with. To me, it does because it, it sh there's an organization and an order to it that when we do what is truly best for us, I don't mean best for us in the short, in the egotistic sense, short term, but truly best for our soul and our heart and our life and our, and our joy, we actually serve others too. And I just feel like that rings so deeply in me that this creates a resonance that goes right through all the way through me. And, and I, uh, and it's the song I sing. Yeah. How did you get to this way of being, especially at such a young age? Who were your mentors? Who influenced you? Well, when I was um, in, in my teen years, um, I, had, I was exposed to the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I, I really uh, felt a connection to, to that work. I later met him. I worked with him. I marched with him. Um, I had the, the privilege of having a number of conversations with him um, personally. Um, and they meant the world to me. And he was my mate, my primary uh, mentor. And, you know, people don't know that, but, but his widow, Credit Scott King, later became a vegan. Um, uh, his, uh, one of his sons, Dexter Scott King, became a vegan. Um, and he himself, of course, was focused on the, the, the civil rights and, 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 and the war and wealth inequality issues also. Um, but he had a feeling for all of this. And if he had lived, he was still with us. I think we'd be in a very different situation as a world. When he was killed, only at the age of 39, by the way, um, in April of 1968, it was, a, it, it was like a bullet went through my heart. And two, and it was shortly after that, shortly after his death, that I told my dad, um, I wasn't going to do Baskin Robbins. And I think that his death was, was so painful for me, um, such a blow that any thought that I might have still had a, a bit of a vestige of, of business as usual and I was gone. A world that, you know, I felt like, how often is it that a man of his stature, of his spiritual stature, spiritual depth, rises to a level of political prominence like that. I mean, you look at our political leaders, they're, they're not people of spiritual substance for the most part. <laughs> Although there are a few exceptions to that. I mean, I, I, I think Cory Booker is one of them, by the way, he's a close friend and I love him. Um, but in general, it's pretty rare that someone like Dr. King, first of all, it's pretty rare that we have a person like that anyway, but then that they become prominent, that's just almost unheard of. And that, that we, we violently killed this apostle of nonviolence. I just felt so much despair at, at that. And I, um, and it changed my life. I felt, I, I, I after that, By no means am I saying, oh, I'll, I'll be like Dr. King. That's way out of my league. That's way above my pay grade. But I will, I will let his insp the inspiration I felt by being in his presence and listening to his, him talk and, and feeling his commitments and his willingness to, to sacrifice for what he believed in. Um, I, I'll, I'll do my best to, to live in a way that he would have liked to see. So in a way he was my spiritual father.
I did not know that. And I'm so glad I asked. Yeah. Yeah. He, one of a kind, you know, and, and, uh, now we, we we make his birthday into a holiday or and we we we, we um, which is great and we name schools after him and we name highways after him and and then we kill children in those schools and I mean, it's just terrible um but i still remember how i felt in his presence i still remember how i felt when he would say words that weren't just words they were forces of nature, forces of spirit, forces of, of, of joy. And um, I, I, I honor that in everybody. I think everybody has a, a little bit of, of, of divinity in them of, of you know, we're, we're part animal, part God, part monster, part saint. I don't know, we're, we're, we're quite the mess, but if we can cultivate the, the, the goodness, if we can follow the examples of people like that, we're gonna be in a lot better shape than if we don't. You know, now there's how you, we, we talked before we started talking for a few minutes about inclusivity and how to build a movement. I find that even vegans don't get along with each other. No, I know, I know. Very, very much that's the case. And so how are we going to attract the attention of the other people when there's so much infighting? Doctors arguing about certain nutrients or like on my show, most of my guests are vegan because I've been vegan 45 years. That's who I know. But I have one that's not vegan and they get attacked in the chat, you know, like how, how and it's like, it doesn't matter how much other good they've done in their whole life, but- yeah. And the thing is, is with very few exceptions, most vegans weren't born vegan. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I have to tell you, <laughs> um, no. And I, and and how it is that we can't then remember what it was like when we weren't and have compassion for that. And I don't know, but we, as a movement, we we suffer from. Be becoming a circular firing squad, as they say. Um, we're just shooting ourselves and we're, we're not being effective. You know, I, I, I'm not one, somebody who wants to wear a save the whales button. I'm somebody who wants to save the whales. I, I, it's not for me about being known as somebody or impressing or carrying a self image of myself as a certain kind of person. It's about actually actually sparing the animals the suffering. It's about actually sparing people from heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity. It's about, and dementia. It's about actually preserving the, 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 the web of life in a viable and, and fertile way. Um, halting the, 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 the extinction of species, halting the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, halting the, 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 all the ways that we are um, damaging ourselves hurting each other and, and killing the world. Um, and the fact that our food choices can play such an, a pivotal role in all of those different dimensions is why I focus there. And I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we can do that. And, and you know, it's, it's a long journey. And when vegans fight with each other and, and you know, I, I, my guests my, that I interview in our summits are not all vegans. They're all friendly to it, but they're not all vegans. And I've taken, I've gotten flack for that um, from the vegan community. Um, but I'm, I'm convinced that if we only talk to ourselves, <laughs> That's funny. I don't even have to complete that sentence, do I? <laughs> Uh, where, where, John, where do you suggest somebody start? Not everybody's going to have a summit or like, you no, say, oh, no. I'll be, but what, like what, what little things can people do to make a difference right now? Well, start where you are, start right where you are. And if you're somebody who eats bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning, you could reconsider that and <laughs> maybe try oatmeal with some blueberries and, and uh, some, 
ground up flax and chia seeds and some walnuts or some, you know, and, and it takes a while to shift your taste buds because when they've been eating the standard American diet, which is so high in processed foods and so high in sugar and fat and salt, you, it, it, it overwhelms your taste buds and it hijacks them. And then you can't taste the subtler tastes, beauty, beautiful tastes of things like blueberries and raspberries and blackberries and strawberries. And, and, and what, when you reclaim your taste buds and stop over, you know, you, you, when you're in a city with a lot of bright lights, you can't see the stars. You, your, your eyes are just overwhelmed with the brightness of the artificial lights or you don't see very many stars, but if you're out in the wilderness where there aren't any lights, you just are just stunned with the beauty of the night sky. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's a, uh, a starry night, if it's not overcast. And so it's like, I think I, our taste buds are like that. When we get the artificial light, the artificial processed foods out of our diet, we, we can taste things that we hadn't been able to taste before. We didn't even know they were there. And so foods that seemed boring, and we thought, oh, you're gonna have to, I mean, eat, eat that, they're great. And, and, they're, and they're nourishing and, and you can feel that and you can feel good about yourselves eating them. And so I, I say with pe people, a good place to start is think about what you eat and think about what, what foods in your diet, in your typical diet are the least healthy ones. You, you know what they are. And can you consider the possibility of eating less of them? And what are the foods in your diet that you enjoy that are the healthiest? And can you consider eating more of them and expanding them and, and, and you know, eating more foods of that nature? So it's not about deciding today to never eat another animal product or another processed food, but can you eat more of what, what, what you know is good for you and less of what you know is bad for you? and start there. And you'll find that you get momentum. You, you're moving in a direction then, and you're moving. And as you move, the next step becomes easier because you have momentum. And it's building that momentum in the direction of your intention. So even the mistakes you make, you're making mistakes in the direction of your intention. You know, if you fall off the wagon, you binge, you, you, you have a, a, a you know, you, you sabotage yourself in some way, what stress gets the better of you, who knows? That'll happen, but you still, you're still moving in that direction. Okay, so you, you had a bad day. We all do. Next day, move in the direction of your intention. And if you keep doing that slowly but steadily, it is always the slow and steady that wins the race. You know, isn't that an old Aesop's tale about the hare and the tortoise? Well, be the tortoise, you know, keep going. It's not about the flash. It's not about the coming in first in the race. It's, it's not about how other people see you. It's about how you see yourself and how you feel about yourself when you look in the mirror and how you feel about yourself when you close your eyes and tune into your heart and, and, and kind of assess your life and how you feel about yourself when you, when you try to kind of understand what impact you're having on other people and on our greater greater world. And when you listened humbly for how you can bring your life into greater accord with the shared heart at the source of all of life, the deep heart, the, the great spirit, and give your life over to what that asks. Um, you know, o obey the dictates of your, your, your highest power, uh, your, your higher power, your, your, your inner voice, whatever language works for you on this, God. Um, things will happen. Things will happen that seem impossible, but they will happen. The good things, synchronicities will happen. Unexpected people will show up in your life that you would never have thought would. And they'll relate to you as, as, as the dignified and beautiful person that you can be. And, and as you become that, people notice 
and they become more that way too. And I think that's what we're here to do. That is beautifully said. What's next for you, John? Do you think you might ever write another book? I don't know, Chef AJ. I, I, maybe. Um, but I, I haven't felt that call. You know, I've written 10, so. Um, 20, 21 more to go. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to be 31. I, I feel like if you wrote the book today, it almost could be called Diet for a New World. Well, yeah, um, that's what we need, isn't it? Is, 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 and if that's really what it is that we're working towards, is a diet for a new world, that it feeds a new world, feeds, feeds our hearts in a new way, feeds our bodies what they really need to thrive. Um, and and does so without plundering and pillaging and preying upon other species and other life forms and other people. I just think we can do better. I, I really do think we, we have it in us to create a cooperative world, a world where we cooperate and generate harmony and work together more and, and work against each other less and um, befriend each other more and, and, and polarize less. It, it, it's not the direction that we see a lot of uh, around us now. Um, it, it's, uh, I feel a little bit like a salmon that needs to swim upstream against the current to get home, to get to our place of spawning, to get to where we need to be. I don't know how a salmon does it. I mean, they, they, they're born, you know, then they go downstream, they, then they go from a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish, and they spend a couple of years in the ocean. I mean, they don't have GPS, well, I guess they do. And then they find their way back up, up, they swim against the current all the way upstream to where they were. How do they find that? How do they do that? It's a miracle, and, and yet they do. And, and we have it in us, I think, to, to find our way back home. But it does involve swimming up against the current sometimes and shifting from being a salt water to a fresh water or vice versa fish. And, and but that's the only thing that, that calls me is, is how do we generate enough belief in ourselves at this point in time that so we don't give up, so we don't you know, become numb, so we don't accede to resign ourselves to the, the forces that are, are at work in our world today that are, are, are so damaging. They're there and they're causing tremendous pain um, we, we need to be with that pain and we need to be with, with, with ourselves in such a way that we become a different possibility. We stand, we, we are become a stand for a different possibility than, than what we see around us happening. Um, and I, you know, a world, a world where children aren't, don't have, we, ch parents shouldn't have to worry when they put their kids on a school bus. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of losing it right now. <sighs> it's, hard, it's hard now. It's a really it was horrible what happened a couple of weeks ago. It, it, it keeps happening. Yeah. I just, children. It's... Children. I'm sorry, but I just... Don't be sorry. I think everyone shares your sentiment. Yeah. It, it just feels, it's, it's, it's a disgrace that we allow this to continue. And I don't know the answers. I do know there are countries, I mean, um, in, in, uh, in Sweden, they, they have as, almost as many guns as we do, but they don't have any mass shootings. They don't have anything like that um, because they, they register their guns and they have a tremendous emphasis on gun safety and they definitely keep guns out of the hands of children. Oh, oh my God. And they, they keep hands out of the guns out of the hands of the mentally ill and they, they, they keep, and they don't let automatic weapons, AK, you know, uh, these the weapons of war, military grade weapons. This was an 18 year old kid, you know, in, in Texas. I mean, it's just,
we, we need we need to be warriors, but warriors of the light, not not you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's not a place for weaponry in, in, in life and there's a place for self-protection and defense, but oh, shooting children in schools. There's no, no. And, and it, it, how is it that we can't as a society agree that that's abominable? <laughs> agree that that's deplorable, that's repulsive, that's disgusting. We won't allow that to continue. We will find a way to prevent it, to stop it because it's so egregious. And this wasn't the first time, that's the thing. No, it wasn't. And, 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 and there will be more unless we, we alter our course. And I sometimes think that, that the food is playing a role in this because we, we have a lot of evidence that when you take kids who are in juvenile detention, they, they've broken the law, they're in, you know, they're sent to juvenile hall, they're, they're in the, what we call the correctional system, the criminal justice system, they become incarcerated, they become wards of the court, all these things happen. When you, when you take a group of those kids and you change their diets and you get the sugar out of it, you get the processed foods out of it, you get the, the junk food out of it, you get the artificial colorings out of it in the state and the preservatives out of it, you get the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the bad fats out of it, you get the meat products, so you either reduce them or get them out of it. You can get them on a whole foods plant-based diet. Inevitably, we have so much data on this. Their, their personalities change. They become less aggressive, less defensive, less violent, less insubordinate. They become more cooperative. They learn better. Their, their school grades go up. Their, their, their um, ability to, to learn uh, grows. Their ability to get along with other people grows. Um, they become more um, uh, pleasant to be around. <laughs> and therefore, people like them better. Therefore, they have an experience of themselves as being liked. Most of these kids have felt hated their whole lives. They felt, you know, marginalized and pushed away and, 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 and um, rendered voiceless and powerless in their lives. And so they, they're wanting to have some sense of power to, to defy against that. Well, if we can help them have an experience of themselves that people like, They'll have a, a genuine experience of, of, of mattering to others and, of, and, and they can help other people who matter to them. So even with something that may seem as, as, as far away from veganism as, as, as school shootings, um, I, don't, I don't know um, that they are that separate because when we, when we take people in prison and before they, they get out, we give them a kitten or a puppy to take care of. And then they, when they get out, they, they get to go with that animal. The recidivism level drops by 50% because they feel they matter to somebody. And similarly, when, when the diet is changed, all these, these antisocial behaviors um, drop tremendously. Now there's some people maybe are, are, are beyond repair. They've been so traumatized and, and, and then whatever, they, we can't help them. But an awful lot of people we can not help. And it's not a panacea. It's not the only thing we need to do. It's not utopia, but it's better. It's a lot better. And we don't even know how much better it could be because we haven't really tried it fully. But when, when we do put it to the test, the results are extraordinary and beautiful. And um, that's why I want to see it tried on a bigger scale. I want to see more and more people, you know, not degrading their nervous system with uh, not polluting their, 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 uh, their brains uh, with, with the crap that we've made it normal to eat. Before I ask you the last question, which really is just for fun, is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with or tell us how we can support you in your work? Well, you can support me in, in my work by doing your work, <laughs> by being who you are to the fullest that you can, for loving the people that you love with your whole heart, for listening, listening as deeply as you can for, for guidance, so that 
you can bring your life, make your life into an expression of your heart, an expression of your love, an expression of your joy and caring. Um, and be a healing force in, in your own life, to yourself, with your self-care and, 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 and with others. Um, that's how you can um, uh, help support me. I, 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 that's all I want is to see us thrive and, and, and have more joy and, and more love and less pain. Thank you. Beautifully said. My final question, just for fun, is if you had to create a 30-second flavor today, what would it be and would it include cilantro? <laughs> no, I I I'm one of the people. That, this is, I, apparently, there's like 15% of the population that to whom cilantro tastes like soap at best. They just hate it. I'm one of those folks. I know that lots of people uh, love it and I and more power to them, but I, I can't stand it. Um, and I'm even allergic to it. I have a sister who was actually had, is allergic to it as well. And she, somebody put some in some food that, you know, and she didn't know it. And she had to go to the hospital, her whole, she had it went into anaphylactic shock. I, I, I haven't ever had that happen, but I think it could if I, if I ate much of it. So no, it wouldn't have cider, but it also wouldn't be ice cream. It wouldn't have any dairy in it. Um, and, you know, I, I, it probably would be made with broccoli sprouts and sauerkraut. And um, um, I don't know. I, I thrive on just simple foods. You know, for me, a great dessert is like a few berries and some dark piece of dark chocolate together. Um, and they can be any berries. I love all berries. And, and um, that, that turns my crank more than a quart of Jamocha almond fudge would. And I say that as somebody that really knows what Jamocha almond fudge is. You're the creator. <laughs> I do, I really do. And, 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 and when people hear that I don't eat ice cream anymore, ever they sometimes feel sorry for me. And I say, please don't. I have eaten more ice cream in my lifetime than you will ever eat in 20 lifetimes, believe me. You have no idea. So don't feel sorry for me. I've, I'm not def deficient, <laughs> I'm not lacking, I'm not impoverished. I'm making a choice for, for, for what I consider to be my and our greater good. And, um, um, and I love things like square of dark chocolate and berries or a banana, for a nice uh, banana with walnuts or pecans. I love those, just that's, to me, that is a dessert. Uh, par excellence. So, you know, I know how to invent ice cream flavors. <laughs> I still could do it. I know, I still remember all the formulas. Um, it's just in there, you know, but I'm, I'm very grateful, Chef AJ, and as I know you are, to have found a, a path of service that doesn't involve just placating people's lower natures or urges, but does involve feeding the heart, feeding the soul, feeding the body the nutrients it really craves and needs to live a full life. And that's what's available to all of us. You know, it's up to us whether we take that path or not. Um, I know you do, you have, I know that you, you encourage you know, hundreds and thousands of people to do so and have been doing this for a long time. I mean, you know, you told me you, you do this every day now. I'm in awe of that. Thank you. Thank you dearly. Thank you deeply. Um, you know, on, on behalf of all of your audience, I thank you. And on behalf of all who are yet to be your audience, I thank you um, because your work, our work, it really matters. Yeah. Well, I not only thank you for your work, I thank you for inspiring hope. Well, thank you, Chef AJ. Thank you. Bless, and thank, bless your heart. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous show.